What's up, Z-Pack? It's your boy, ZDogMD. Check it out. I'm live and direct from Portola Valley, California, where we are on a little radical sabbatical. Uh, this is Incident Report Mobile. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. I'm using my fancy little mic and my iPhone out on the deck in the beautiful Santa Cruz Mountains, where it is dopeness incarnate. Anyways, today I wanted to talk about an article uh, that I shared yesterday that was an expose by the LA Times that really, really... I found fascinating on many levels, not just the article and the uh, information delivered therein, which was uh, initially shared with me by um, Dr. Travnicek, who's one of the uh, pain physicians that we've had on the show before. Um, but the response to the article in the comments that were shared by Z-Packers, I think brings up a lot of really fascinating issues in medicine, in our culture of healthcare, and in how we might build Health 3.0. How, how do we police our own? How uh, do we keep our patients safe? How do we keep our colleagues safe? What are issues around addiction as a disease, supporting people compassionately while making sure we prevent them from harming others? What's the culture in academic medicine? Is there a uh, male-dominated sort of sexist component? And what is the role of money in research institutions and U.S. News and World Report rankings? So all these things came out of this article, which I've linked to in the description. It is by the LA Times. It's an overdose, a young companion, drug-fueled parties, the secret life of USC med school dean. And already it's clickbaity, right? And then you read it and you go, oh, wow, this is legitimate clickbait because it's a fascinating, terrifying, and I think for many people, possibly even a familiar story of addiction, excess, um, abuse of power, a lot of different things. So let me summarize the story uh, for Cindy Cam, who's asking, what is all this about? And then we're going to get into some of the comments. I'm going to read some of the comments on the article that were uh, posted yesterday when I posted the article in the evening when I got it, okay? Now, here we go. So the article was a real piece of investigative journalism by LA Times reporters. This, none of this would have been public were it not, from my understanding, uh, for the LA Times investigative journalism digging into this. So they got a tip about a gentleman named Dr. Carmen Pugliafito, who's 66 years old. He is the dean, or was the dean, of USC's Keck School of Medicine, a very prominent uh, medical school. It's been rising in the rankings in US News World Report's hospital rankings uh, for research and other topics ever since he joined as dean, I believe in 2006 or seven, if I'm remembering correctly from the article. Um, now, what's fascinating is the article starts with, um, during his tenure as dean, apparently, Puglia Fito kept company with a circle of criminals and drug users who said he used methamphetamines and other drugs with them, a Los Angeles Times investigation found. Um, six, uh, Puglia Fito, 66, and these much younger acquaintances captured their exploits in photos and videos. The Times reviewed reviewed dozens of the images, but did not make them public, by the way. Um, these images were shot in 2015 and 2016, and they showed Puliafito and others partying in hotel rooms, cars, apartments, and the dean's office at USC. Now, here's the summary of the, of the story. As dean, okay, he was overseeing hundreds of medical students, thousands of professors, clinicians, all kinds of research grants totaling like $200 million. And he's a key fundraiser for USC, which is a private medical school, bringing in more than a billion dollars in donations by his estimation. Now, understand, USC is competing in, in California with uh, mostly with the state medical institutions and with Stanford and other private school and other uh, assorted private schools that do research. The state's uh, system, the University of California, often will compete for researchers and the resultant grant money that these researchers bring in uh, to the institution. So when Puliafito came to USC, there was actually a lawsuit ultimately resulting from one, uh, one of the recruits that he brought in, which was a, a, a very rather prominent Alzheimer's researcher that he poached away from the UC system. In it, this is the accusation. So there's a lot of money 
at stake. These, these medical school deans are very important in bringing in research dollars and prestige and growth to a university. So this is not a trivial position, you guys. Dean of a major medical school is a huge, huge deal. So when it came out that this guy was <laughs> smoking methamphetamines, potentially, according to the pictures and the story that this uh, uh, paper is breaking, uh, heroin, other serious drugs, partying with young people. And then the, the way that this came out was one of these young girls was a, an escort or a prostitute. He had hooked up with her, was engaging her services, uh, apparently or allegedly, and um, was the Times reviewed video of him, you know, and pictures of him uh, doing drugs with her, including methamphetamines. She's sitting on his lap smoking, you know, heroin, this kind of stuff, at least according to the images. And they showed it to police authorities. Police confirmed that that's what it looked like they were doing. Now, the way it came out is that apparently he was, the allegation is that he was in a hotel with her. She overdosed on something, either a narcotic or a GBH, the, you know, date rate date rape drug they, he called 911 and made a report saying you know his friend drank too much or whatever it was and police came she got taken to the um, uh, hospital got better did fine police never really finished a report on it I think it the report was released three months later but a tip to the LA Times broke the story to them now in the process last year um, a couple months after this alleged event and before any of this became public, this just became public like yesterday or something, uh, he mysteriously resigned from USC as dean. And the question was, why was that? He gave the, the, the explanation that he resigned because he wanted to pursue biotech and other things. And lo and behold, he did get a job in biotech. Subsequently, he was laid off when the drug failed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now, going through the retrospectoscope, the question is, well, did he, and you guys got to read the article to get the details off the kind of harrowing details of the kind of people he was hanging out with, the depth of clearly what was an addiction for him, um, his abuse of power. So he would bring these people into his office to party at USC. He would tell, you know, they were quoted as saying he would say things like, these students think I'm a god and all this kind of stuff. Now, this is all in the article. I'm repeating what is an LA Times investigative piece. We don't know how much of this is actually, the veracity of all of this, how much of this is actually true. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is not to be sensationalist and all of that because I think the LA Times has already managed to succeed in doing that. And the people who've read the article have already heard this story. The reason I tell you this is to go, okay, now here's the question. He's already gone from USC, but he, he's gone from USC's dean school, but he still represents USC. He still does research there. He still sees patients there. He's a prominent ophthalmologist. That's his specialty. And he's well known in circles, uh, particularly retina especially, uh, as a huge luminary in the field. He gives talks at conferences. He still uh, um, speaks on behalf of USC. So he represents this organization. The Times has now outed him as... Uh, uh, potentially a drug addict, somebody who uh, 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 might have put others' lives in danger by providing them drugs. He pro have certainly provided this escort money, and he's still seeing patients while all this is happening, potentially being impaired, although no clear evidence of that. So the question that came up when I shared this article is, here we have an academic environment, a very powerful person, number one, did USC cover up for him or never let this stuff out and just he quietly resigned? Or did they not know? What's going on in the academic culture that allows this kind of thing to happen? Is it appropriate to keep it secret? Is his privacy important? Does any of this matter? Should we be self-policing? Or did, we, did the LA Times basically point out a dangerous criminal who's impaired who shouldn't be touching patients? This is a fascinating, because look, dude, I'm going to tell you. When I worked at Stanford, there were impaired physicians, all right? And yes, they kept it quiet. I'm just saying this is the academic culture. And I'm not singling out Stanford. I'm saying this is the case across healthcare. And the academic environment is one of particular old boys sort of networking. And I've gotten a few messages to this extent. So let's read some comments on the article 
as shared on my Facebook page. And I'll get to your comments. But I think these comments are really interesting because I want to address some of the the ethics and the and the thinking that goes behind some of these because that's what we do here on Incident Report. So let me pull this up. There's our live show. There's some posts from the other day. Here are the comments. Great. So when I posted it, it got 1,800 um, likes, mostly angry faces and wow faces, 402 comments and 311 shares. I posted it last night. Okay. The first comment is me. I will never again accuse ophthalmologists of being boring. So this was me trying to be funny. That comment got 245 likes and a few um, more interesting comments. So one of them saying, actually, Abby von Nuremberg said, actually, addiction is really boring. Most people who are avid drug seekers act out and act out with sexual compulsivity have very narrow lives focused on using, seeking, and hiding addiction. There's a great deal of isolation and reduction of other activities. It's sad and not actually interesting when you support someone in the grip of addiction. Being rigid or compulsive sucks the joy, fun, and meaning and interest from life. Now, I see what Abby was pointing out here is that I'm joking about this guy's addiction, but the addiction is actually not funny. It's very, very sad. So this is one take is here is a guy who's suffering, who deserves some compassion and help and recovery rather than ridicule. So there's one take on it. And I'm sympathetic to this viewpoint. Let's keep reading comments. Here's a a really interesting one. So Kyle Varner, this guy's private behavior should remain private. There is no reason for a media outlet to investigate or publish on this topic. It's yellow journalism. People could have people who could never have made it in medical school are looking to bring down someone who could. It disgusts me. Okay, now this obviously led to about a hundred comments, many of them angry, some supportive. Let me try to interpret what Kyle is saying. We in the medical profession, and I'm I'm trying to give you my interpretation of what I think he's trying to say and I'm not defending or or attacking him. We in the medical profession feel attacked on all sides by people who have no understanding of the medical profession. The Health 1.0 people in particular feel like we ought to be self-policing and we ought to take care of our impaired physicians and rehabilitate them. When we're attacked from without by government, by administrators, by employers, by other people, we feel like this is inappropriate and an an invasion and continual erosion of our authority and autonomy. This is a common position in medical circles. So that's what I think he's trying to say here is that the LA Times is invading this guy's privacy. This is normally handled by medical boards and and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it should go through the proper process. Now, my, I, I have some sympathy to that viewpoint, but mostly I'm going to take the tact of the many people who wrote back and said, this guy is endangering patients' lives. The only way that this came out is by an investigative journalism piece because if USC knew that this was going on, they were keeping it a secret. Now, I'm not saying they did. I'm just saying if they did, clearly it didn't come out. He was still seeing patients. He was still representing USC. Right, And there wasn't any evidence that he's in drug rehab or and getting any kind of help or any kind of compassionate treatment. He's just continued to – they sweep it under the rug if this were – if they knew. No one is saying that they knew, but this is if they knew. Now, the fact that they – if they didn't know means that the LA Times did a service here because they basically said, guys, no one's talking about this. He's still seeing patients. He – not only that, but he's molding young medical students – as the dean, right? Not anymore, but he's still probably interacting with them. He represents a massive organization that has a reputation. And not only that, but he represents the medical profession, which the last time I checked was still highly trusted, even though that tends to erode when shit like this comes out. All right. So my take is, yes, could we do a better job self-policing? Sure. Is privacy important? Sure. Except when it affects others. And in this case, it is directly affecting the lives of his patients. He is a surgeon. Now, some have argued in the comments that he's clearly not impaired because he's able to do these drugs, have these all night parties by the allegations and still is able to practice in a way where people are getting great outcomes according to this. Now, 
Does that make it okay? Does that make it safe? Does that make it a good model? Does that make it something we should replicate and tolerate? All right. So these are the questions, the big two questions that we want to answer. And I am going to tell you what I think. And I'm going to assume, I'm going to operate, I'm going to use this as a case study, not specifically talking about Pugliafito himself, but talking about it in an abstract case study because he is innocent until proven guilty. When the press does this, okay, first of all, his reputation is ruined. He's already been convicted in the court of public opinion. So he has to go through a proper process, either fess up and get help, or go through a criminal justice process, or go through a proper investigation, or if it's all BS and this paper is wrong, he needs to sue the F out of them for libel because they have destroyed his reputation and have them cite sources, you know, just like the Gawker thing, right, with Peter Thiel. So let's assume for the sake of this discussion that he's guilty. He's no longer Dean. All right, these are my thoughts, and then we're going to take comments. In academic medicine, we have a culture of covering this shit up. This kind of behavior is allowed because he's bringing in a ton of money to the organization. There's an old boys network, and I say boys because it is run by boys. If you've read Francis Connolly's book about Stanford, you will see, and I knew some of the characters that she talked about in it in her book, and yes, it is all true. Um, it is a male-dominated, really crazy sort of club where people can get away with a lot of shit, showing up to work drunk, being impaired, sexual uh, misconduct. Across the board, um, this kind of thing uh, was – people looked the other way. Could that be what's happening here? Absolutely it could be what's happening here because we see it all the time. Is this the way we want to build a health 3.0 transparent, open, collaborative system? No. Is it going to ruffle some feathers in the old guard that I say this? Of course it is. That's why it's the old guard. They want to say, well, we, as long as we're tolerating what we're doing, we're bringing in money, we're taking care of patients, what does it matter? It matters because we still have trust. In the community, we are actually held to a different standard as healthcare professionals. That's why when people accuse me occasionally of being unprofessional in rants that I'll do online or something like that, I do take it very seriously because we are held to a higher standard. I will still defend what I did, but I do listen to that criticism and I take it seriously. All right? Um, uh, let's take a quick comment. Brian Smith, innocent until proven guilty. Thank you. If he did this, he should have to answer for it. However, he should have the opportunity to defend himself before being destroyed by the news. Well, this is my take, Brian. He should defend himself if he's innocent. Um, if he's guilty, he should confess and get help, right? Um, and if he's innocent, he should defend himself. He should sue these guys for libel. He should pursue this, and he should um, become rich based on how he's been wronged. And that is also his prerogative in the United States of America. So I agree. And I think we're not trying to convict him here. We're using this, this article as a case study to discuss the various facets of this, which I think are very important. Um, let me read some more um, comments from the piece because I, I, they're so interesting to me. Um, I, By the way, I got one private message today from a, a female physician who has suffered – in academic environments from uh, abuse by people like him. And I found it a very compelling story. So this is not a, I mean, it's not just a female male thing. It's, this is just a question of abuse of power, hierarchical health 1.0 uh, training and conditioning, and how people like this are allowed to get away with it because so much money is involved. Um, let's see here. It baffles me to think that why, according to California Medical Board, his license is still in good standing, says Yanni uh, Asmatic. Uh, that Pasadena incident happened more than a year ago, and by all accounts, his license should have been suspended or revoked already. Well, that's the thing. It wasn't brought up. Now, remember, Michael Jackson's um, uh, doctor, Conrad Murray, didn't lose his license in Nevada until a long time after uh, everything was convicted. So, again, he's not guilty until he's convicted in a proper uh, process. So this is just a, an LA Times article. So I actually agree that, you know, we should be trying to figure out whether people are impaired, but you cannot 
have them be guilty until uh, uh, proven innocent. They are innocent until proven guilty. Um, what else do we got here? You know, Mary Beth says this one is a blow to the gut. He should be banned for life to use USC on anything, and he should be charged with murder. Now, no, no one that we know has died, Mary Beth, but I understand the intuition uh, on this. And again, read read the investigative piece just to understand what he's being accused of. Um, and then he, we can see how he defends himself. But there was an update. Apparently today he has been removed from any patient care duties at USC and USC is taking action. So we're going to see in the short run what ends up happening. I will be really interested to see what USC knew about this and the ethics of withholding any of this information from the public given that he's still seeing patients, right? Um, and you know what's interesting is I get the sense from some of the comments that I've gotten that people are defending him who actually might not see what he did as that wrong, which I think is fascinating for medical professionals. Look, we've all, we all know medical professionals who abuse drugs. We all know medical professionals who suffer with addiction. We all know, and you guys know that my uh, uh, model of addiction is a disease model, not a moral failing model. So even if that's all true, I think it's very hard to defend him continuing to practice without some repercussions or um, medical help for his uh, addiction before he can safely do that. Now I'm going to get to your comments, guys. Um, you know, and the other thing is like, again, how much does uh, a U.S. News and World Report ranking matter to a school? It, apparently it matters tremendously because they recruited this guy to raise their ranking. Now, here's some interesting backstory. Apparently, he was accused of roughing up uh, an optometrist that he was working with that was assisting him over some equipment, and that case was uh, settled privately and, and uh, with a sort of a gag order uh, prior to him coming to USC. And the question is, why didn't this information uh, influence his acceptance at USC in the first place? Like, what was missing from that disclosure? Was anything missing? Are we vetting our doctors appropriately and our other medical professionals? Or did USC drop the ball on this? Um, let's see here. Uh, let's scroll it down. What kind of comments we have here? At the very least, this is a violation of do no harm, says Jay Carucci. Kiss his license, bye-bye. Well, if he's convicted of this stuff, yes. Um, let's see. David Wolpert. There's no specific time frame in which complaints are handled. One complaint, once a complaint is received, it will be reviewed by an analyst. The analyst will gather necessary informa information to evaluate the complaint. I think he's talking about the medical board. He's quoting from their site. Depending on the complexity of the complaint, it may take several months to review and or resolve. Refer to our brochure, how complaints are handled. And this is from the California Medical Board. So there you have it. David Wolpert, thanks for sharing that. Um, Judy Zimmerman, he had videos of himself doing heavy drugs on premises of his USC office and with his uh, escort mistress. Meth, coke, heavens knows only what else. And this is the accusation in the article. Again, we have not seen the video of this. It was reviewed by the LA Times with law enforcement, but it wasn't revealed publicly um, because their sources wouldn't allow that. Um, other comments here. Let's see. Nancy Bedrosian says, definitely hold him to a higher ethical standard. Although not explicit, some young people may have assumed a level of safety in partying with a physician. They would have taken risks they otherwise wouldn't have assumed if they weren't with a medical provider. Nancy Bedrosian. Nancy, this is an amazing point. So it was clear in the article that these he would brag to these people about you know who he was. And his mistress Googled him and was like, oh my God, he's the dean of USC Medical School. And she was quoted as saying that he saved her life by calling 911 when she overdosed. Would she have overdosed? Would she have taken risks? Would she have felt as comfortable if he were not a physician and she was just partying with another guy her age who didn't have that standing? This is an excellent question. Could he have actually harmed people in a way that was particular to his stature, respect in society, and standing. And as such is the magnitude of a crime that he may or may not have committed even greater. These are the questions we need to be asking ZPAC when we consider we in healthcare want, often want the benefits and respect that go with our standing as trusted um, 
shepherds of health and wellness and, and pillars of the community. But we often shudder when we think we might face the downside when those standards aren't held up. Is that fair? Are we treating ourselves with a double standard? Um, I actually think we should be held to a higher standard. That's why I have very little patience with people like Dr. Oz, et cetera, because I feel like they've let us down uh, in terms of upholding their obligation. That's why when I uh, attack the movie What the Health, I feel like the doctors in that movie are not upholding the standards of science and objectivity in being a part of a movie like that. They may do fine research on their own, but being a part of that one-sided um, piece of crap is not a good uh, way to uphold your standards as a physician. Do I uphold the standards doing the show where sometimes Tom and I will curse and we'll drop F-bombs and we'll you know, uh, attack pseudoscience and we'll throw ad hominems around? Let me know. If you think I'm doing a disservice, then let me know. I think on balance, we do a service by being an authentic voice in a area where voices are inauthentic. So we can talk about this USC guy without me worry, worrying about losing my job or offending a sponsor because I don't care about offending sponsors. If my sponsors are offended, they can go sponsor something else. If the people that I go speak for are offended, they can cancel my talks and that's happened in the past. I don't care if I can't be an authentic voice for what I want to say with you, ZPAC, then why have the show? Um, all right, let's see. Other comments. Let's see. According to the LA Times, someone anonymously reported this to USC prior to his resignation, Bella Soul. Okay, so I missed that part, Bella. So someone had announced it to USC and then he mysteriously resigned. So it's pretty clear if that's, if that's true, if that's true, and we're saying this is all allegation, then USC knew something and what was their responsibility? And this is going to be a shit storm for them, clearly, right? A massive shit storm, which is probably why the LA Times is cackling and rubbing its paws because they scooped a story that is going to cause just months of chaos and controversy. And honestly, okay, let's take a second here to talk about the press. We love to bash the press. Trump loves to bash the press. Press Both sides of the political aisle feel wronged by the press. The press is still a crucial, independent arm of U.S. civil discourse. And we should defend them to the death because this is what they do. They are trying to find those stories that no one's reporting that have been covered up. Do they always do a good job? No. Do they have bias? Sure. Um, should we still try to make sure they're the best that they can be and support them as we can? Yes. And you guys know that I don't love the press. They've misrepresented shit that I've said a million times. They've um, uh, 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 done uh, disservices to our movement and services to our movement. But that's the nature of the press. I would never try to silence them or attack them in that way. I would say that's what they do and we should support them. All right. And in this case, I, I, I support the LA Times for trying to reveal what's going on here. Um, Jay Carucci, uh, I teach on many levels academic freedom. I call it as I see it, and I'm not afraid to be raw with my nurses, PAs, and med students. And I will use this to keep fighting for medical ethics. I mean, that's excellent. That's what we want to do. Um, And it's a never a war on the press, says Dave Walpert. Um, okay, uh, I think <laughs> Brett and Brent Posse, everything about you except those blue blockers is awesome. These are my uh, Jay-Z Rockaware glasses that I got on Amazon for 40 bucks, And I'm wearing them because it's bright AF out here. Uh, and also I look really tired. Not from met methamphetamines, just from being really tired all the time. Um, so guys, on that note, I'm going to go through your comments and try to look at some more. Um, I think the other thing I want to say is that I want to eventually, as more information about this case comes out, I want to unravel some of the power dynamics here. Here is a very powerful guy, and there are pictures in the article of him hanging out with Hollywood celebrities at fundraisers. Very, very prominent guy, very well-known guy. Are those guys immune from this kind of stuff until the press says something, right? And should they be? And I will tell you again, my experience in academia is that they are. And is that the right thing? Should we be standing up as a group and saying, oh, hell no, 
That's not how we do it. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap this. I'm going to turn this into a podcast. It's going to be up on YouTube and on the website in the next day or so. I'm going to get back on the incident report schedule, um, and I want to end with a quick uh, Facebook Live ad. If you could just sit through the 15 seconds and watch it and maybe tell me what you see, that'd be great. It helps support the show, helps support Tom and Logan, who are right now hard at work at the studio remodeling it for when we come back. We're going to have guests. It's going to be a beautiful new experience for y'all and hopefully a mouthpiece for y'all and Health 3.0 in general. Thanks again for everything. Please share this. Hit like. Um, spread the word about Incident Report and everything we're trying to do, and leave your comments. Your voice matters. This is a forum for your voice. Peace. Thanks, CPAC. I love you. We out.